الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل واشهد ان لا اله الا الله الملك الحق المبين واشهد ان محمدا رسول الله المبعوث رحمه للعالمين وان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار. We begin the name of Allah, all praise and glory belongs to Allah, Lord of the worlds. Indeed, Allah is deserving of the best of thanks and the most beautiful of praises. Those that we say in far above and beyond anything we can say about Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, the glorified and exalted. We testify that no one is worthy of our worship and our devotion and our dedication and our absolute love and obedience but Allah alone for any partners. The true Supreme King and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was indeed in truth His Prophet and His servant and His messenger whom Allah sent as a mercy to the worlds. To begin, why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose that our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam come forth from the purest of ancestries? And that he alayhi salatu wa sallam have the most impeccable, brightest smile. And that he alayhi salatu wa sallam above and before all had the most flawless morals, the most flawless ethics. Because Allah Azza wa Jal through that was legitimizing him. I claim legitimizing him by that perhaps more than by anything else. Because whether people like to admit it or not, we as human beings historically, and this is even capitalized on in marketing, we are more moved by people, personas, personalities that impress us. We see that as more legitimate. We're more inspired by those that impress us than those that convince us. Our decisions, we may not admit it, are more emotional than we think, and less intellectual than what we may realize. And so Allah legitimizes the message of the Prophet ﷺ by what? By the person who carried that message. And so, to delegitimize the Messenger ﷺ as a person, is the number one tactic if you want to call his question in, call his message into question. And that's why when we see so many attacks against the Prophet Sallallahu quote unquote civility, his peacefulness, when they question his mercy Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, that has been a major catalyst behind what he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also foretold, that at the end times, people will enter Islam in waves, but also leave in waves. Because to delegitimize the messenger is to call into question the message of that messenger alayhi salatu wa sallam. But for those that are paying attention to the importance of this, they take all the allegations that are made against our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, him supposedly not being a nice guy and just waiting for the right time to strike, being an, an opportunist, or him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam requiring his followers supposedly to force conversions as a requirement of their faith, they see that as an opportunity, and we should, and a necessity, as we should, to rediscover the beauty of his character, alayhi salatu wa sallam. And so anyone who studies the narrative, the life story of our Prophet ﷺ would by that immunize themselves, immunize their families, their children, their communities from the allegations. They would be able to decipher which is an honest depiction, which could not possibly be our Messenger ﷺ, what was his norm and what were exceptions to the norm. As a matter of fact, and this is very important, the more we study the life of the Prophet wasallam, the more you realize these exceptions to his mercy were in fact not even exceptions. They were other dimensions of his mercy that he wasallam, failed to under, people failed to understand. And so studying the seerah, this is the importance of studying his narrative, his life story. It liberates us, it liberates us from the manipulative illustrations of our Prophet ﷺ. And it helps us notice firsthand what Allah said about him. Not that he was a mercy to the worlds, but that he was nothing but a mercy to the worlds. That everything about him ﷺ was that mercy. But when you have superficial information about his life, when it's just casual information about his life, then you could be prone to, may Allah forbid, doubting that. 
You know, there's a phenomenon called anti-intellectualism. And it's a product of the information age that we live in. Anti-intellectualism is basically the disregard for expertise, right? Anti-intellectualism is not the result of ignorance. Because the person that doesn't know, they know they don't know. They realize they need to learn. But it's the anti-intellectualism comes from the assumption of knowledge. When someone's out there that thinks they know, that there's nothing more to the story, right? And so I don't need to go find out. And so people that think they know the life of the Prophet wasallam, they feel qualified to pass a judgment about him. Or when you go online, when everything is just so Googleable, right? Is that a word? It is now. <laughs> You just think there's nothing more to the story. You know, it's like, uh, they, they say that like some Islamophobe, some supposed expert, uh, just because he has a website. And they do have a lot of money. Right, Shabal? They got a lot of money. Are they hiring? <laughs> I mean, somebody from, uh, from <laughs> never mind. <laughs> and so, just because he has a website, he has funding behind him, and then he come, and he can't even spell his name in Arabic sometimes, right? Supposedly an expert on Islam and says, You know the religion of Muhammad? <laughs> this Islam he brought, the first obligation on that blood on this in this religion, this bloodthirsty religion, when you become Muslim, the first thing that happens is what? They cut you. It's called circumcision. <laughs> and then if you think that's too tough and you want to leave, you know what happens? They cut you. <laughs> Decapitation. And so a person that thinks there's nothing more to the story, he goes and checks with a sheikh who doesn't understand the context, context sometimes, and the sheikh fumbles the answer, the person will walk away thinking, oh man, I, this is all I need to know. I get cut on the way in and cut on the way out. <laughs> Why would I want this? But when a person takes ownership of, of his Prophet wasallam's life, you know personally, I, I developed a newfound appreciation for the Prophet ﷺ in that article that Yaqeen Institute, the paper uh, that Yaqeen put out. You all know Yaqeen, yes? Uh, Sheikh Omar, I believe, gave, gave a talk about doubt in here, right? Yaqeen Institute for Islamic Research, called the 70 Moments of Moral Greatness. How the Prophet ﷺ consistently and always rose above enmity and insult. You know when I collected the first few dozen incidents? I said, wow! Allahu Akbar, our Prophet ﷺ really was amazing at containing himself. But then, to, I'll be perfectly honest, the more I kept collecting, I realized it wasn't just self-control. That he ﷺ was really something humanity has never seen before. So you need to give yourself time to develop that realization. And you need to know that this is not a given in your family, it's not a given in your children. Wallahi, by the end of the research, I was sitting there like, I remember the statement of one of the Salaf when he said, if only we were with our enemies, as he, with our friends, he said, as he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was with his enemies. Things would be swell, fine and dandy. If we can treat our friends the way he treated his enemies, alayhi salatu wa And so a person begins to shift when they learn that from feeling qualified to critique his morals, the, the morals of the Prophet ﷺ, whom Allah said was on an exalted standard of character. So now getting in the back seat and saying, no, 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 whatever happened in, its li in his life, if it is confirmed that it happened, there must be something wrong with my discretion, my understanding of it. That's the comfort zone every believer needs to be. And you need to give yourself time to gradually allow that to crystallize inside. And I want to give one example regarding this that was very moving for me in that paper, The 70 Moments of Moral Greatness. And that was the conquest of Mecca. And the conquest of Mecca is truly worthy of being called a conquest like no other. I mean, you can only begin to imagine what it's like for our Prophet wasallam and the Sahaba to march into Mecca. Like after all these years, you walk into these streets, these alleys where we were beaten to bloody pulps, right? These places where children were pulled apart, like the son of Abu Salama and Umm Salama, their arms dislocated. This is where Sumayya was killed. This is where Bilal is tortured. These are the homes of the people that gutted open Hamza. 
this is the place, this is the place where Khadija anha was kicked out and she never recovered from, from the boycott and Abu Talib as well and they died in the same year. You don't think that they were not thinking about these things when they walked into Mecca. And so when they saw the leaders of Mecca, the Sahaba said to Abu Sufyan, Al-Yawm Yawm Al-Malhama, today's payback time, today is the day of slaughter. Your people will finally get what they deserve. And so when news of this reached the Prophet wasallam, he said, Bal Yawm Yawm Marhama. No, today is the day of mercy. Today is the day Allah will honor Quraysh. Allah will honor the Kaaba. Allah will guard the Kaaba. Clean slate. This is the day. And then after they secured the city, they all gather in front of the Prophet ﷺ at the doors of the Kaaba, and he says to them, ماذا ترون أن يفاعلون بكم? What do you think I'm going to do with you? And so they say خيرا, like you'll only do good with us, you're going to be the bigger man. And they say to him, أخ كريم ابن أخ كريم, noble brother, son of our most noble brother, we all know you're the most noble family in Mecca. Where was that 10 years ago? Right? We all know like, and so he, then he says to them something والسلام, that is unimaginable. Like think of what victors do when they enter countries, how they make an example out of the leadership, how they gloat over punishing those that resisted them. And he had every right and every ability, but he wanted something more. His heart was was different, it was far more alive. And so he immortalized his legacy of forgiveness, of mercy, of matchless morality by saying to them, لا أقول لكم إلا كما قال يوسف لإخوتي I will not say to you anything, but what Yusuf said to his brothers that kicked him out, stuffed him down a well, got him sold into slavery, got him thrown into prison, I will only say to you what Yusuf said. لا تثريب عليكم اليوم يغفر الله لكم. There will be no blame on you whatsoever today. I pray that Allah forgives you. Meaning, I pray you get the message now and become Muslim, so Allah will forgive you. And then he says, "Ithabu antum qulaqa." Go, you are unbound. No one's going to touch you. Go ahead, go about your business. This was so unexpected, so unbelievable, that even some of the Sahaba, some of the Ansar, the younger Ansar, I want you to stop here for a second, because this is the point. Even some of the Sahaba who lived around him, but not as long as the Muhajireen, not as long as the early Ansar, you know, the Muhajireen, the migrants from Mecca, and the Ansar are those that received them and stood with them in solidarity. Some of the younger ones, that did not yet have the full image of who he was alayhi salatu wasalam, in the toughest hours, in the darkest moments, that nothing could bend him alayhi salatu wasalam. They said, لَقَدْ أَخَذَ هَذَا الرَّجُلْ رَغْبَةٌ فِي قَوْمِهِ وَرَعْفَةٌ فِي عَشِرَاتِهِ They said, this man, Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, he's become overtaken, he became soft by his compassion for his relatives, and his hopefulness for his town. You know what they're saying? They're saying he's tired of fighting, he's hopeful to move back to Mecca, he just wants to just put it all down. That's it, he just, he can't anymore. It has affected his judgment. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he says, and then revelation came down. And when revelation came down, it was always clear to us and nobody would lift their eyes, their stare at the Prophet Sallallahu when he was undergoing that experience of receiving that weighty revelation. He said, then it concluded, and he looked up. And he said, you have said that this man has been overtaken by hopefulness for his hometown. He wants to go home. قَالُوا نَعَمْ كَانَ هَذَا Yeah, we, that was said. That took place. And so he said to them, أَنَا عَبِدُ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولُهُ I am the slave of Allah and His Messenger. هَاجَرْتُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَإِلَيْكُمْ I migrated to Allah and towards you. فَالْمَحْيَا مَحْيَاكُمْ وَالْمَمَاتُ مَمَاتُكُمْ My living is with you and my dying is with you. The Ansar turned to him in tears at this point. 
And they said, Wallahi ya Rasulullah, ma kulna, ma kulna hu illa dhinnan billahi wa rasulih. He said, Wallahi, the only reason we said that was out of protectiveness for Allah and His Messenger. We don't believe you would do that, but we're afraid that you're going to do that. We're afraid you're going to leave us. We couldn't bear that thought. And so the Prophet ﷺ, he says to them, إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ يُصَدِّقَانِكُمْ وَيَعْبُرَانِكُمْ Allah and His Messenger believe you. And they excuse you. They ex- the Prophet ﷺ understood that what he just did of supreme forgiveness with Quraysh, I can excuse you for not being able to comprehend that this was for no worldly benefit, for nothing at all, just because this is who Allah wants me to be. I know it's hard to believe that a human can do this, وَيَعْبُرَانِكُمْ That's why I'm excusing you. And so it takes time. Don't expect of yourself, you need to dedicate time to this. Invest time to this. Rehearse this reality about the Prophet sallallahu I don't know if time is up. So I'll close in. <laughs> and so the last thing, the last point I want to make and then get off the stage is what about the incidents now when the Prophet sallallahu appears to have stepped outside of his norm. He did take part in battles alayhi salatu wasalam. He did command, though we must reiterate always, and I get tired of saying this disclaimer. Though he did command as the head of a state to take certain people out, to execute certain people. And our country, by the way, does that with drones all the time. As the head of a state, he did that. But is that immoral? First of all, the first thing we need to do is, we have to agree that this wasn't his norm. If you're not going to agree that this was not his normative practice, the standard, the default for the Prophet's lifestyle, and that's what that whole paper was about, 70 moments to wash out everything else, right? Let's first establish that's the norm. Because if we're not going to establish that's the norm, then you're not being fair and there's no point in continuing the conversation. Or perhaps you just need to pick up a book and don't talk about a subject you haven't read one book on. And then from there we say that the Prophet ﷺ did take part in these incidents. At least those of them that were confirmed. That's another issue, right? Overinflating the list. He did take part in this, number one, against his own will. In other words, he wished he didn't have to, ﷺ. For example, the Prophet ﷺ says, Don't wish to meet your enemy. Allah Azza wa Jal says, فَإِنْ جَنَحُوا لِسَّلْمِ فَجْعَلْ لَهَا وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ If they incline to peace, you incline to peace. Don't initiate, don't go look for it. And put your trust in Allah, that Allah will make the peace work out. But then if he didn't want to, why did he? Because ultimately, our Messenger Wasallam's mercy was not for us to brag about him in lectures. That's not the primary reason. He did this out of devotion to Allah. And so he did this because Allah wanted him to do this. And so his mercy is not going to interfere with justice either, or obedience to Allah when Allah tells him to do something. So for example, the Prophet ﷺ wished inclined to spare the captives at Bedr. He wished to do that, right? ﷺ. And when he did so, Allah sent down ayat criticizing this decision. Why didn't you wait for revelation? You should have put your foot down here. They should not have been released. And so him and Abu Bakr Siddiq were found by Umar crying because of Allah's criticism of them that they went with the default without double checking. Is it applicable here? So does that mean Abu Bakr Siddiq and the Prophet were more merciful than Allah? No way. Allah is the most merciful who gave them the aptitude to be merciful. He taught them how to be merciful. He's the one that inspired their hearts to be like that. But Allah Azza wa Jal knows best His creation. That unlimited mercy and unconditional forgiveness will not work all the time. It can be seen as weakness sometimes, right? Like when the Prophet wasallam, for example, executed Abu Rizda. Abu Rizda is a warmonger. He's a poet who gets the troops up and going for the battle of Badr. He was caught captive. The Messenger wasallam, releases him. He 
promised I'll never do it again, fine, I won't start up a war against you. Then he releases him. He's caught again a year later, bringing a triple-sized army than the one in Bedin for Uhud. And so he says, oh Muhammad, I'm never going to do it again. And so the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Wallahi, you will not strut in Mecca any longer saying, I tricked Muhammad twice. And he commanded his Zubayr ibn Awwam, he said to him, a believer is not bitten from the same snake all twice, we need to put our foot down here. And Abu Isa was executed by the head of the state. Right? Why? If you excessively focus on this quote-unquote harshness, you're going to lose sight of the fact of how much mercy it entails for everybody else. So even that was an expression of his mercy alayhi salatu wasalam. It was generally avoided. He would avoid it whenever he could. But he would not let that inclination of his be distorted by our human perceptions. You know there's a beautiful ayah when Allah Azza wa Jal sends angels to tell Ibrahim alayhi salam, we're going to destroy the town of your nephew Lut. The people of Lut, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? He started debating with us regarding why there's believers there, can we wait a little longer? The mercy in Ibrahim alayhi salam, they didn't want to see it happen. They didn't want to see a town destroyed. But then Allah says what? He says, Inna Ibrahim al-Halimun awwahum munib. Ibrahim alayhi salam was forbearing, grieving, meaning he was hurt by human suffering. Allah is pain praising him for that quality. It hurts him to see that. But then he called him Munib, but he's frequently returning to us. He didn't let that feeling inside him, that noble feeling, stop him from resigning to Allah's decisions in the end. So it's like surgery almost. Surgery should be generally avoided. But when it is the only way to stop, to save someone's life, we are very welcoming to surgery. We don't say this doctor is an animal. Look at how big that cut was. You know how much blood he lost in that surgery? Likewise, Allah Azza wa Jal, for societal pre- preservation, He told His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you cannot act on that all the time. There are certain times when it was necessary for the greater good of everybody. Because Islam was about mercy and about strength. Excessive mercy is weakness, it's humili- humiliation, you get run over. And excessive strength is oppression. And so Allah struck the balance between those two noble values. Through the story of Ibrahim salam and elsewhere, He taught His Prophet wasallam, do not be like the merciless, merciless of Quraysh. Don't be like that. But don't show so much mercy that it will embolden those without mercy. Some people just don't understand compassion. They don't understand forgiveness. So don't do what will embolden them. And what will make so many other people vulnerable, because you want to have mercy here, you'll be at the expense of all that mercy there. That was the perfect, perfect model of our Prophet ﷺ's values. Without seeing his life story head on, normative and an exception, and the understanding of how that exception applies, we will not be able to grasp this, and certainly a 20 minute lecture won't do it for you either. Forgive me for the elongation everybody.